Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this is Nick Weiner from Open Channels and Marine Debris .info. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar this morning. Uh, presenting for us today will be Angela Howe uh, from Surfrider. We'll also have Bess Ruffman from Bess Ruff. Sorry, I'm adding. Where's your name? Uh, from the Bren School at UCSB, and also Elisa Lohman from Patagonia. Um, just a quick housekeeping note, just to let you all know how to ask questions. Uh, in the GoToWebinar control panel, uh, there's a little questions box down there near the bottom. Uh, anything you type in there will come to Sarah and I on the back end. Um, and then we'll relay those to everyone at the end of the webinar. Uh, if there's any like quick clarifying questions, we'll put those through right away. Uh, so with that, oh, and we'll also, we are recording today's webinar, and we'll have that posted on openchannels.org in about two hours. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Angela. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nick. So yeah, today we'll be talking about microfibers. This is a new form of plastic pollution um, that's emerging. We're getting more and more information of it from it. Uh, luckily, uh, we have Bess Ruff from University of California, Santa Barbara, Brin School of Environmental Science and Management to talk to us about their recent study that was published uh, in September of this year. Um, all about microfibers, what they are, and how they interact with our environment. Um, and Alyssa Lohman from Patagonia to talk a little bit more about the um, how corporate sustainability is overlapping with this issue, um, where you have uh, companies that produce uh, clothing and uh, goods that may contain microfibers. So we're calling this the next frontier of plastic pollution because it's a new issue. Um, we uh, We'll talk a little bit about the difference between microplastics, microfibers, and microbeads. Um, but this is just another uh, form of plastic pollution in our environment that's adding to uh, all marine debris and is a, is a major form of pollution affecting marine life, habitat, and potentially the food chain. So once we talk about the issue and how grave it is, we'll talk about the search for solutions and, and what we can be doing as um, consumers and environmentalists and how to address this, uh, this issue for future generations. So sorry, I'm going to switch to the next slide here. Okay, so first just want to give a big thank you uh, to Nick Werner and the Marine Affairs Research and Education um, entity as well as marinedebrisinfo.org uh, for putting this uh, webinar together and helping uh, broadcast it to all of you. Additionally, um, we have, like I said, Bess Ruff from UCSB Bren School of Environmental Science and Management. Um, so this is really the program that kicked off the most comprehensive research. There were studies in 2011, 2012 kind of exposing these microfibers as microplastics that are you know, in hot spots where wastewater goes into the ocean. Um, but really, they, they helped inform us all with um, their September 30th, 2016 research, um, Environmental Science and Technology, under the title, Microfiber Masses Recovered from Conventional Machine Washing of New and Aged Garments. Uh, Bess is also a research fellow at Sustainable Fisheries Group in Santa Barbara. And then our panelist, Alyssa Lohman, is a senior manager of product responsibility at Patagonia. She's responsible for researching and measuring the environmental impacts of Patagonia's products and developing and implementing programs aimed at reducing those impacts. Alyssa's been working with, on environmental projects for Patagonia for 12 years. And prior to that, uh, she worked as an environmental specialist with the city of Ventura. Uh, Alyssa has a bachelor of science degree in zoology from UC Santa Barbara a master's degree in environmental science and management from the Brin School, and a doctorate of environmental science and engineering from UCLA. Uh, and finally, uh, thank you to the West Coast Marine Debris Alliance. Uh, this is an organization that came out of the West Coast Governors Alliance on ocean health, and it's turned into a diverse coordinating body with members from several sectors, including state, federal, and tribal governments, NGOs, academia, and industry working together to advance actions that address marine debris and marine plastic pollution on the regional scale. Our objectives include addressing marine debris by identifying gaps, finding funding, sharing information on effective actions, and measuring progress. You can find out more at marinedebrisalliance.org. So that said, let's talk a little bit about microfibers. So one of the big questions uh, we get here at Surfrider Foundation as a grassroots organization with our members really interested in this issue of plastic pollution is 
Okay, what are microfibers? How are they different from microplastics, which I've read about? And then the whole microbeads that we did a lot in addressing last year um, with the federal legislation. So here's a few definitions. Microfibers are, are kind of what I think of as threads. Micron scale synthetic, synthetic fibers, mostly of polyester or acrylic. Um, so those are the microfibers that go under the class of microplastics which is a broad range of tiny plastic particles, including plastic fragments and plastic fibers. So, so microplastics can also be when a plastic bag gets into the ocean and it doesn't fully degrade but breaks down to smaller and smaller pieces. Um, that turns into microplastics. Um, and then microbeads are what we found in many consumer products, uh, like when you wash your face with a scrubbing uh, face, facial soap. It's very small polyethylene or polypropylene spheres that are widely used in cosmetics, skin care, and personal care industries. So widely used until they're phased out in 2017 uh, thanks to the um, uh, Microbe Microbead Free Waters Act, which was signed by Obama in December of 2015. So that was a great effort by Five Gyres, uh, Surfrider Foundation, Story of Stuff, and several other environmental groups that were able to pass that legislation at the federal level after several states had acted to, to stop um, the production and consumption of these polluting products um, uh, in, in our environment. Uh, so that was kind of a successful campaign, but I, a lot of people get that confused with microfibers, which are in all of our synthetic clothes, clothing. So. Um, the big, the big issue with microfibers and why it's, it intrigues me and I'm looking forward to our presentation today um, is that they're, they're so small um, and normally with plastics we're really concerned about, about them being ingested by marine life um, and possibly clogging stomachs and um, possible entanglement with the larger items. But, but these very small uh, microfibers actually get enmeshed in the intestinal lining of the fish so they become part of um, the fish and part of the food chain as smaller fish and even oysters get consumed by larger and larger fish and then possibly end up on our dinner plate. So um, essentially the plastics we're washing down the drain with our laundry may work their way up the food chain. Most plastic pollution poses threats to marine life through ingestion entanglement but like I said these are so small we're worried about um, the toxic and bacterial exposure uh, once fish ingest them that is leached from plastic. 78% of all chemicals known to be persistent in our environment, bioaccumulative in the food chain and toxic to life are found on microfibers. These are known as persistent organic pollutants, uh, for instance pesticides, flame retardants, endocrine disruptors. Micro microfibers seem to be getting stuck inside fish in ways that other microplastics aren't, like I said, enmeshed in their gastrointestinal tracts. Microfibers are smaller than human hair and can be as small as half the size of a red blood cell. Uh, according to a Mark Brown 2012 study on microfibers, uh, the quote was, as human population grows and people use more synthetic textiles, contamination of habitats and animals by microplastics is likely to increase. So let's put that in the overall context of marine plastic pollution. Uh, at current trends of consumption, if we continue to behave in the same ways that we are right now until the year 2050. Uh, scientists predict that there will be more plastic than fish by weight in our ocean by 2050. Um, so this is, this is something, this is a fact that we hope can mobilize people uh, towards changing their behaviors and, and really understanding what single-use plastics do to our environment. So in addition to the 270,000 tons uh, of plastic that already exists in our ocean, and that's an estimate by Five Gyres. It's now estimated that billions of microfibers escape wastewater treatment plants every day. And how does this affect the marine life? Uh, recent studies have shown 50 to 80 percent of dead sea turtles have ingested plastic. Um, impacts of marine debris are reported for 663 different species and over half of these reports show entanglement and ingestion in these larger pieces of marine debris, like I said, and 80% of plastics, um, of the impacts were associated with plastic specifically. So overall marine debris may include um, other materials, but really what we're seeing is plastic as that pervasive and, and caustic 
um, type of, of debris. Uh, in general, plastic litter starves, poisons, strangles, and results in other harm to marine life. Uh, the toxic chemicals are not only um, leached out of the plastic once it gets into the fish, but toxic chemicals are made in the production of plastic, and then it also attaches to plastic in the water. It, it picks up other toxic chemicals from the water before it's ingested and in marine life, and potentially impacts human health for when we eat fish. And um, I was actually at a, a science panel put on by Monterey Bay Aquarium a few weeks ago, and they said, well, it's not only people who eat fish. Um, fish stock is actually fed to chicken and pigs, so, so people who eat pork and chicken um, can also be uh, affected. I mean, this is just really pervasive in the food chain. Um, so it results in uh, billions of dollars of damage and cost to fishing, tourism, and other shipping industries. Again, that's larger marine plastic pollution. State and local governments have responded uh, to the significant ecological and economic impacts with innovative policies. So we're seeing policies, such as in California, to reduce uh, plastic waste. And uh, California last Tuesday passed Prop 67, which affirms the statewide law banning single-use plastic bags. So we're already seeing uh, stores uh, get rid of those thin single-use plastic bags and require customers to bring reusable bags or purchase a bag for 10 cents. Um, so that we're hoping really will will help impact the marine debris issue, the, the single-use plastic bag litter issue. Uh, we've seen it work successfully on the local level. And now uh, California has been the first state to adopt it statewide as a state law. We also um, have been tackling this larger plastic pollution issue through um, uh, expanded polystyrene packaging bans, recycling laws, deposit refund systems, and extended producer responsibility policies. But the consumption of single-use plastics is still incredibly high. So um, recently the microfibers issue has been called the biggest plastic problem you may not have heard of yet, and I'm hoping this presentation will be able to inform a little bit more about what it is and how it's affecting us, and then we'll come talk about the, the search for solutions. So with that, I want to hand it off to Bess Ruff from um, the Brin School. Uh, thanks, Angela. Um, so let me get this pulled up. Um, so like Angela said, my group mates and I have been working on this um, project for the past year and a half with Patagonia. Um, and it's been in conjunction with the Bren School and it's part of our master's group thesis um, that everyone at the Bren School goes through. And the main objective was our, of our project was to quantify the shedding of fibers from Patagonia's garments. Um, so I'm going to start off with just a brief overview of our results for that to provide context for some of the wastewater treatment plant stuff we're going to talk about in a little bit and also go a little bit more in depth on the ecological impacts that we've uncovered through our literature review. So like Angelo was saying, uh, we're looking at microfibers which are specifically synthetic fibers that are five millimeters in length or shorter. Um, and specifically for our project, we are looking at what impacts uh, washing ap approaches have on micro microfiber shed. So we were looking at washing machine type, um, traditional front load and traditional top load machines, and also what effect the garment's age has on how many fibers are shed. Um, previously, Dr. Mark Brown had estimated that about 1,900 fibers are shed uh, per wash. And we found a number that was a lot higher than that. Um, we found that average shedding per jacket was 1.7 grams. And this is equivalent to about 81,000 fibers. So a lot higher than the 1,900 number that um, Dr. Brown came up with. Um, and so in our specific results looking at uh, washing machine types, we found that top load shed a great deal more than front load. Um, and when we say traditional top load, this is uh, the machine, obviously, where you put your clothes in the top, but it has a central agitator that helps move the clothes back and forth. Um, and there's actually a 430% difference between fiber shed and a top load versus fiber shed and a front load. 
And one of our hypotheses for why this might be happening would be the central agitator, you know, grinding the clothes and moving them back and forth as opposed to in a front load where it's more the gravity of the clothes falling against each other that's doing the washing. Um, but I've actually spoken to a couple people who have high efficiency top load machines, so basically don't have the central agitator, and uh, they actually felt that their clothes ended up wearing down faster uh, versus a top load, so I think that would be an interesting um, thing for the appliance industry to look at is, you know, even if it's high efficiency and you're removing the central agitator, is it uh, doing more damage to your clothes and therefore um, causing greater shedding? Uh, depending on the outcome of that, you can see that uh, we also looked at new and aged garments. Um, so aged shed more than new. Um, so in the, in the instance of high efficiency top load, wearing down your clothes faster potentially, um, that could prove to be uh, more of a disadvantage than any advantages of removing the central agitator. Um, so we found that there was an 80% difference between aged jackets and new jackets um, in terms of the mass of microfibers that were shed. Um, I, when we say mechanically aged jackets here, we're talking about um, putting new jackets through a 24-hour wash, uh, which Patagonia calls a, kill, a killer wash, um, and it's supposed to mimic, mimic aging of the garment. Uh, so once we knew how many fibers or the mass of fibers that were coming off of these jackets, we wanted to estimate how many fibers are actually entering our aquatic uh, habitats through wastewater treatment plants. Um, so we came up with a wastewater treatment plant model um, and after an extensive literature review found that there are removal rates from everywhere from 78% to about 98.4%. Um, and so what we did was we took the average removal rate of 85% for California wastewater treatment plants and we scaled this up to a city of 1,000 people, which is roughly the size of, of Santa Barbara. Um, and some of the assumptions in our model were that each person washes one garment per day. So based on our 1.7 grams per garment coming off in the wash, scaling that up to 100,000, we get 170 kilograms of microfibers entering the wastewater treatment plant on a daily basis. And with the removal rate of 85%, we get 145 kilograms of these microfibers being removed and filtered out either through primary or secondary treatment. Um, and a lot of times these fibers are ending up in sewage sludge um, which is a biosolid uh, byproduct of the wastewater treatment process. So 145, it's a pretty large amount, but we still have 25 kilograms of microfibers that are getting through the wastewater treatment plant and being introduced into local water bodies. Um, and so 25 is obviously a lot less than 145, but unfortunately that's still equivalent to over 4,500 plastic grocery bags ending up in, in our water bodies. And this is assuming one garment wash per person per day. Um, uh, and so it's also important to note that even the fibers that are being removed in the wastewater treatment plant can still end up in the environment. Um, sewage sludge is increasingly being applied in agriculture as fertilizer. Um, so there's also the potential for runoff um, from these applications and these fibers can still ultimately end up in um, the aquatic systems. Um, so now that we know the mass of fibers that are potentially entering the aquatic environment and it's not an insignificant amount, it's important to understand the potential ecological impacts. Um, I want to caveat a lot of what uh, the information I'm about to present because microfiber research is so new a lot of um, the findings are in the context of microplastics in general, uh, but there are also some situations where the research was microfiber specific. So I'll be sure to say microfibers when it was specific to microfibers and then uh, microplastics in general. Um, so obviously they're prevalent in not only our marine and freshwater ecosystems, but it's also found on land. And there's also been very recent research that has found microfibers in, in our atmosphere as well. 
Um, microfibers have a large surface area to mass ratio, uh, and this allows them to sorb concentrated amounts of toxic compounds, either in the production process or through the wastewater treatment process. And because they're highly mobile in aquatic systems, they can transport these pollutions pretty easily from one location to another. Um, and then also Angela talked about how all, uh, all manner of species have been found with um, microfibers either in the gastrointestinal tracts or in their tissues, uh, everything from zooplankton to shrimp to mussels, pelagic fish, even whales, um, and filter feeders uh, such as oysters and clams and mussels are especially susceptible because they are processing so much water. Um, and one study actually found that regular consumers of European shellfish can ingest up to 11,000 microplastic particles annually. Um, and for the larger species where they're just getting entangled in their GI tract, um, the effects that we would be more concerned with would be the chemical effects of, okay, what have these microfibers picked up either in the wastewater treatment process or even just in the environment and how is that impacting um, the tissue uh, of, of these animals that are consuming them. Um, there's a huge knowledge gap regarding the effects of human consumption. Um, obviously, there have been a lot of species that we eat that have been found to consume microfibers, um, but studies have indicated that high concentrations of some of the chemical compounds that are found on microfibers um, are associated with endocrine disruption, uh, learning disabilities, impaired brain development, and even increased incidences of cancers. Um, so these are things that always need to be kept in perspective when thinking about um, the impacts of consumption and, and, it, and microfiber pollution and chemical compounds moving up the food chain. Uh, there has been trophic transfer of microfibers, so it's definitely something that is invasive in the food chain and, and could potentially have significant human impacts. Um, so in our lit review, we found a lot of case studies about uh, specific impacts of microplastic and microfiber pollution on the environment, and so I'm going to walk you through a couple of, of the um, more intriguing and maybe ones that you wouldn't have been considered previously. Um, so here we have a nice little beach scene, kind of what uh, Dr. Brown would have studied in his um, paper, and he found that up to 85% of microplastics in intertidal zones are microfibers. Um, and another study found that sediments that contain high concentrations of microplastics or plastics in general uh, warmed more slowly than sand that didn't have as many um, particles. And what this does is it changes the thermal properties of the sand. The sand doesn't retain heat as well. It doesn't heat up as much um, as, it, as it's usually supposed to do. And this study hypothesized that this change in the thermal properties could significantly impact sea turtles, who uh, you may know the, have um, their hatchlings, the sex of their hatchlings is determined by the temperature of the sand in which they're hatched. So if you have these beaches and the sand that's not warming up uh, as it's supposed to uh, up to normal temperatures, you can actually have a greater number of male hatchlings than female hatchlings. So you're having these, these population dynamic impacts um, from the microfibers that um, are just invasive in the environment. Uh, I also talked about um, the sorbing qualities of microfibers. Uh, in addition to toxic compounds, they can harbor bacterial assemblages and transport them throughout the aquatic environment. Uh, one study looked at upstream and downstream habitats near a wastewater treatment plant and found that um, these bacterial assemblages in the downstream habitats uh, that were found on microplastic particles, and these were often associated with human gastrointestinal infections. So even if you don't eat any seafood or you know, you're vegan and you're not eating any of the chicken or, or the pigs either, you know, just going 
in the water near somewhere, uh, near a wastewater treatment plant, or even just in the ocean, you can pick up these bacteria um, that are on these microfibers. There's also direct impacts to organisms that Angela touched on briefly. Um, as I mentioned, bivalves are particularly susceptible because they're processing so much water. And studies have shown that um, filter feeders that consume um, microfibers have decreased reproductive rates in the form of smaller egg cells and slower sperm. So they're producing fewer larvae. So again, we have those uh, population dynamics potentially being affected. Um, and unfortunately, some organisms are actually attracted to eating uh, microfibers and microplastics. Um, the algae that sometimes attaches itself to the plastics elicit a chemosensory response in organisms such as copepods, and copepods are a cornerstone of the marine food web. Um, and a study by UC Davis, I think it came out last week, actually showed that seabirds have a similar response in that they're attracted to consuming um, plastic particles. So this is all still rel relatively nascent research, um, so there's still quite a few knowledge gaps to fill, and the Brin School team has highlighted some of the ones that we think will be crucial to answer moving forward. Um, so the first of these is the release of hazardous chemicals. Uh, as we mentioned, um, microfibers are coated with substances that enhance performance. So you have odor resistant compounds, you have water resistant compounds that are being applied. And it's not known whether A, these are entering into the wastewater treatment plant, and B, if they are, if they're getting removed in the process or if they're traveling into the aquatic environment with the microfibers. There's also fabric construction. So does how a garment is assembled make a difference as to how many fibers it sheds? Are there assembly techniques that could reduce shedding? Um, this is something that, that apparel companies and, and Patagonia can, can look into. Um, we've also talked about the fate of sewage sludge. So what actually happens to fibers that end up in sewage sludge and get applied to crops? Uh, what's the potential for runoff? Also, are the compounds that are attached to these microfibers getting into our soils and affecting our crops or in any way? Um, also, shedding characteristics. So in our research, we found that smaller microfibers are probably the ones that are most likely getting through wastewater treatment plants. So is there a pattern or a common factor in determining the size of fiber shed? Is there a way? Um, to structure garment or produce textiles where the fibers that do break off are larger in size and therefore more likely to be removed in the wastewater treatment process. Also, we looked at one type of washing technique, the type of washing machine that you use, um, but are there other ways that we can wash our clothes that reduce shedding? Does cycle length have an effect? Does the temperature of the water have any impact? And also, are there detergents maybe that we could use that limit the amount of fibers that are coming off. And lastly, and I think what is probably going to be most important uh, moving forward in the way that hopefully we'll be able to get some action on this is that what are the potential impacts of consuming microfibers? Uh, is this a really important health issue? Um, is it something that the global population should be concerned with? And, and what potentially would happen from consuming um, high concentrations of not only microfibers, but also just animals that are also um, affected by their consumption. So, you know, as Angela mentioned, like even eating chicken and pig, if they're fed um, fish byproducts that have been potentially contaminated from compounds from microfibers, are those impacting us um, in any way? So these are all questions I think that are really important moving forward, and I think Alyssa and can speak to Patagonia's approach to to answering um, some of these, like fabric construction and and shedding characteristics. Thanks. Um. So this is Alyssa from Patagonia. 
Um, and I was just going to sort of review um, how Patagonia got involved in this particular issue and and explain a little bit of Patagonia's background to start and, and sort of why it made sense for us um, to dig in on this topic. Um, Patagonia is an outdoor apparel brand. We're based in Ventura, California, and we're a privately owned company. Um, we're about, I'd say, 40 two or 43 years old, and throughout the history of the company, um, Patagonia has been very involved in the environmental movement and very aware of the various environmental impacts that result from um, doing business, especially doing business like the business that we're in, which is making clothing. Um, so one thing that I often like to sort of review is um, Patagonia's mission statement, just as a starting place that sort of explains um, our priorities and our ethos. Um, so the mission statement's up on the screen, and it's to first make the best product, um, second to cause no unnecessary harm, and then third to use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. Um, and the family that owns Patagonia, um, you know, this mission statement really reflects their approach to business. And first and foremost, we do our best to make the best products we can so that our customers, um, you know, of course, are satisfied with the performance of the product, but then also that they can use the product for a very, very, very long time and the product stays in use um, and does not become waste quickly. Um, and then the next step is to really make that best product, but do it um, in a way that minimizes the environmental and social impacts on um, sort of our our planet and our society. Um, and so what that means is that we're always trying to look into what fabrics we're using, um, what dye technologies we're using, and do our best to understand what the environmental impacts are. And then once we have an understanding, um, to, to figure out ways to minimize the harm. And then the last piece is really to um, to tell our story and to share what we've learned about our business process and about our impacts and then try and use it as an example to inspire others to um, also be introspective about you know, how they do their business or um, what decisions they're making in their lives to try and minimize environmental impact. Um, and so I think this um, example of microfibers is a really um, good one that matches up with this mission statement. Um, and just to give a little bit of history um, on Patagonia's efforts to um, look deeper into the products that we're using, um, the materials we're using in our products, and um, minimize the harm that they're causing. And um, up on the top left is an image from a catalog that we um, put out that talked about why we switched our entire line to organic cotton. And that was a decision that was made in around the mid-90s, 1995-96, and it came after learning about the super harmful impacts of the pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers on um, the land and the people working in the fields. Um, once we understood those harmful impacts, we knew um, we had to make a change, and the change was to switch our entire line from conventional cotton to organic cotton. And that was um, a decision that we stuck to all these years, and this year was our 20-year anniversary of being 100% organic cotton. Um, then on the bottom there, we have uh, just hemp, and we've been using hemp in our line for years, and it's um, a low-water low pesticide crop um, and uh, more environmentally friendly than some of the other natural fibers out there. Um, and then on the right is recycled polyester. We've been using um, basically the process of recycling bottles into fabric also for about a, the same amount of time that we've had organic cotton in our line. And um, you know, to us, this is a huge environmental decision to use resources that have already been extracted and keep them um, out of the landfill and keep them in use. And um, over the years, we've just increased the amount of recycled polyester 
um, used in our line. We also use recycled nylon at this point, recycled down, recycled cotton, and, um, and we're always looking for ways to integrate new, more responsible materials into the line um, and, and then minimize the harm that's caused in the processing of the materials. Um, so with that background, that sort of brings us to um, this, um, this issue of microfibers being found in the marine environment. Um, and in 2011, we first learned about the link being drawn from um, washing clothing, specifically synthetic jackets, um, to finding fibers in the marine environment. And there was a journal article that came out in Environmental Science and Technology. Um, and we were, you know, made aware of this issue then and um, talked to our colleagues in industry at that time. And um, it was so new. And it didn't gain a ton of traction that particular year. Um, but in 2014, um, another piece came out that was a little bit more, um, it, it definitely linked the issue to the outdoor industry. So sort of early 2015 when this issue was brought to sort of the top of Patagonia's leadership team, um, and Patagonia is inherently linked to fleece um, because we're very much known for our um, fleece products that we make. And so our leadership team really decided that um, we, we needed to learn more about the issue. And these two questions that are up on the screen, um, do microfibers shed from synthetic jackets, specifically Patagonia jackets? Um, and if so, is this causing harm? And the environment, is this causing harm to organisms? Um, and uh, we just didn't know. And we didn't, we didn't necessarily have the bandwidth to um, deep dive into this issue. And so um, we enlisted a group of excellent students to help us um, look into this project. So um, Patagonia, again, is based in Ventura, California, which is about you know, 45 minutes away from UC Santa Barbara, which is a um, great university in California. And we have partnered with the Bren School. Um, it's now been a total of four research projects. So this um, microfibers project was the fourth. Um, and we knew that the Bren School was an excellent partner and that the students that um, are part of the brand school are exceptional students and that the work products that come out of these group projects that they do for their master's thesis are, um, you know, top of the line, excellent projects. And um, this was a particular issue that we knew we had um, a bit of time to dive into and the brand school projects um, are allotted one year to start and finish. And so we thought this was the perfect way to um, learn more about Patagonia's specific um, involvement in the microfibers issue and um, also gain a greater understanding about the larger um, context of the issue. So when we started the project, we had um, a few main objectives that, you know, Patagonia really felt was the most important things to get out of the project. And, um, we wanted to know how our products were performing when they're being washed and, and if they were shedding and if so, how much they were shedding and be able to sort of compare a few products to see if there was um, one particular bad actor or one product that was particularly um, that shedded uh, the least. Um, so um, we also wanted to understand the role of wastewater treatment plants in fiber release and to know if, if, if that could be a place <coughs> in this process that really stopped the fibers from entering the marine environment or if there was a lot more that needed to be done um, before that end of pipe location to prevent the fibers from entering the environment. And then the last piece was to really understand the context and, and to understand like are these fibers actually causing harm in the environment? Um, and so, as you guys just heard from Beth, um, they executed on all of these components of the project, um, came up with results, 
did a super thorough literature review for us so that we knew we had you know, scoured the journal articles available um, to know what research had been done and what was found in that research. Um, the students also um, kept track of different articles and pieces in the media that were addressing this topic. And um, that was a great uh, asset to us to know how much attention this issue was getting throughout their project. And then it just continues to get more and more attention. Um, so um, we, we felt like we really ended up in a great position and had a great understanding of our role um, in, this, in this problem and, um, and a true understanding that this is a big problem. Um, so, you know, Bess went over some of the conclusions, but we quickly <laughs> concluded that, yes, synthetic jackets are shedding during the wash process, and Patagonia's are no exception. Ours shed as well. Um, as Bess mentioned, some fibers are captured in the wastewater treatment plants, and some are not. Um, so knowing this, it's super important to look at every step in this process to find ways to capture more and more fibers to minimize those that are exiting wastewater treatment plants, minimize those that are actually entering wastewater treatment plants. Um, the other big thing that we learned in this process and then in subsequent conversations and meetings that we've attended is that just because there are particles in the ocean, um, doesn't mean that they are coming only from jackets, and it doesn't mean that they are synthetic. So um, most clothing products are shedding in the wash, not just synthetic. Um, there are lots of natural fibers that are used in clothing that are also shedding. Um, and then also there's lots of stuff that's being found in wastewater treatment plants. Um, and it's not all synthetic, again, some of it are sort of natural fibers, some are fibers coming from toilet paper, some are things that look like fibers but are actually oils or greases. And so it's um, there's a lot still to learn in order to understand like what percent of these um, of these particles being found in the marine environment are actually synthetic. Um, and then also um, as Beth went over there's a lot of research um, that's proving that there are ecological impacts. And those are definitely things to keep in mind going forward and um, keep in mind when um, supporting and uh, initiating future research, because there's, there's a lot more research to be done. Um, the data gaps that are particularly interesting to Patagonia, and they are interesting to us because we feel like um, well, specifically the, the first bullet there, the types of fiber and fabric construction that result in the greatest amount of shedding. You know, that's an area that we, we are really directly connected to. And so we want to identify um, those fabrics and fabric constructions that are going to shed the least. And then with that in mind, um, uh, um, work to address this issue from a, an industry um, level. Um, and then again, this, this next bullet, um, types of fibers that are primarily being found in the environment. So that goes back to the fact that not all these fibers are synthetic and not all are coming from jackets. So what are these other fibers and where are they coming from? And, and um, you know, how do we address this issue as a whole? Um, and then the last piece, the toxicological impact of fibers um, to organisms or humans, that's, that's just, um, you know, super interesting and super important to the company. And I think, the, like, a very key thing we want to figure out and learn more about going forward. Um, and then um, this is just sort of, places that we've found in this process of fibers being attached to fabrics to the to the end output of them in the environment and all the steps in between. 
Um, there's opportunities to minimize um, fiber shedding during fabric production and making fabrics that shed least, making high quality fabrics that are constructed in a way that they're going to um, stay assembled. Um, and then home laundering solutions. There's going to be opportunities for consumers to um, uh, integrate mechanisms to capture fibers um, during the wash process. So how do we get this information out to consumers and work to change behavior to, to make the home laundering an opportunity to capture more fibers? Um, and then looking at technology in washing machines and in washing in general, and how do we, um, you know, update washing machines and washing technology to minimize um, fiber shedding. Then the wastewater treatment plants also will have a space in this issue um, that's, that could result in the need for huge infrastructure change. And it seems like a really big area, um, a big change to make, but, you know, it's worth bringing it up and, and um, there could be opportunities there. And then always, you know, what does policy look like around this issue? And the microbead example is a big success when it comes to policy. So is there something in the future that could address this particular um, fiber pollution issue? Um, and then in regards to Patagonia and what we're doing, um, we're really looking to identify potential laundering solutions. So when our customers come to us, to say, wow, this is a huge issue, which it is, and it's been a real stumper for us um, to say to to have a solution. We, we just don't have a super um, effective and tangible solution at our fingertips at this at this specific moment in time. But we want to identify some solutions soon. And so, um, what are laundering solutions for consumers? Um, there's two examples on the slide here. Um, the High surface laundry ball is something that was designed by a NGO called the Rosalia Project, and they're working on developing this technology um, that will hopefully be available to consumers in 2017. Um, and then the other things that Patagonia is working to do around this issue is um, look to fund additional research and also NGOs that are working in this space to address aquatic pollution um, through our 1% for the planet giving. Um, and that's something that, you know, we have a long history of doing, but we really want to focus more on this specific space and this specific issue for our funding. Um, the other thing is that we can engage and are engaging with industry um, to talk about what the industry can do in a large way to address this issue. And, um, Patagonia is part of the Outdoor Industry Association, and there are several brands within the industry that um, are also really engaged on this issue and are coming together to meet to talk about what we can do next. Um, so we look forward to being able to collaborate and have sort of a broader reach with solutions. And then the last thing is that we have partnered with NC State. Um, on a research project. And the focus of that research project is to develop um, a test method that uh, fabric manufacturers and brands can use when we're developing fabrics that can identify the potential for shedding. And so the idea is that that's something that could be integrated into um, the other standard tests that brands and fabric manufacturers use when developing fabrics. And Patagonia has a lab that we do all of our testing in, and this could be one additional test so that we know at the beginning of fabric development whether or not the product's going to shed or have minimal shedding. So those are the things that we're involved in right now. And um, I am happy to see that, you know, part of this webinar is to um, talk about solutions because it is it is a tricky issue and it is an issue that um, has a lot of different players in it and all the different players have different abilities to sort of move um, this issue forward and so I think you know this is where Patagonia is and and um, and then I think that there are lots of opportunities um, for the NGO space for the appliance industry um, 
and for sort of the larger um, wastewater space to um, to get involved in this issue. So um, that's sort of what I have for today, and I'll pass it back over to Angela. Angela, you're still muted. Uh, you have to unmute yourself on the control panel. Okay. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> I was saying thanks so much to Alyssa and Bess. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, and yeah, like like Alyssa was saying, you know, we're we're really on this search for solutions. Um, you know, I, I'm a parent of two young children, and um, the, the ocean is going to be their playground uh, in the next generation. And um, you know, I'm one of my goals as a parent is to not feed them plastic. So <laughs> we have our, our work cut out for us. And so I think first that requires understanding the problem. Uh, this definitely isn't an easy one. We don't really understand the full food chain impacts. Um, we're just beginning to understand a little bit more about how this affects the, affects the marine environment. Um, but there's definite ways that we can address this. And, and huge kudos to Patagonia and the Bren School for for tackling this and, and bringing it to our attention, um, really important. And we need more brands like Patagonia who, who are able and willing to face the problem head on rather than, than bury it and ignore it. So I think, um, as Alyssa alluded to, I think we can uh, categorize the search for solutions into three different categories. Um, clothing or the source of microfibers, uh, wastewater systems, um, how water is getting into the ocean, how it's being filtered, um, and technology. So yeah, the appliance industry, washing machines, um, how can technology address this issue? So um, I know that we're beginning to learn a little bit more about it. Trash Free Maryland actually is doing samplings of Chesapeake Bay and has found synthetic microfibers in the water. There's medical, middle school students who found synthetic fibers in their samples of the Potomac River. So we are starting to understand this a little more, question a little more, and with that research um, comes a little more informed um, decision making and, and uh, the road to solutions. As for washing, um, more agitation and more waters uh, basically equals more microfiber release. So reducing the amount of water, which is good in Southern California anyway since we're in a drought, um, and reducing uh, the times that synthetic clothing are washed and um, you know, not using uh, front loading but top loading, as Bess was describing, high efficiency washing machines, um, or not, sorry, using front loading and not top loading. Um, and uh, Bryn School researchers found that top loading machine, washing machines release five times more microfibers than front loading washing machines. The more you wash it, the worse it gets. So aged jackets uh, release two times the amount of new jackets. Um, and when possible, avoid using powder detergents and wash clothing at lower temperatures, which will save energy as well. So those are a few things. Another thing with washing, um, uh, as Alyssa mentioned, the Rosalia project is putting together an innovative microfiber catcher. And they have a really good little video, if you just Google Rosalia project, on what that is. And they're currently in the prototype stage um, testing it. Uh, uh, but it remains to be seen how complete that will be. and um, and how far they can get that distributed, but it is one solution to filter microfibers before they exit the washing machine. Um, the the one uh, solution that really appeals to me is closing the the loop on um, on the water system, not draining to the ocean anymore. So recycled water systems, um, for for no water to flow to the ocean, you need to reuse it. And uh, a lot of times this will uh, involve reverse osmosis filtration, which will definitely get the microfibers out. Um, and the typical secondary treatment plant, which uh, filters most of our wastewater in America, uh, will not do an effective job of removing microfibers, as we've seen. Plants that employ tertiary advanced uh, treatment uh, to produce reclaimed water for non-potable uses typically do uh, remove the microfibers. So wastewater treatment plants that use advanced treatment to produce potable water use microfiltration, which will definitely uh, remove the microfibers. Um, so the more that we're seeing recycled water, um, you know, either purple pipes to irrigate crops um, or uh, 
um, to tap water, recycle water to tap water with very advanced microfiltration uh, technologies. Um, that will not reach the ocean. It's being reused, which we need to do anyway, and it consequently um, will remove mi microfibers um, and other pollutants. Uh, so this, this to me is more of the 100% uh, solution, uh, but it is a huge effort and uh, something we've been advocating for at Surfrider in our water quality work and our understanding you know, that runoff and um, outfalls pol pollute the water with chemicals and, and other um, bacteria, but now with microfibers as well. It's something that we've been um, addressing and advocating for in the past. So um, I think that's something that we're going to really be looking at, especially, like I said, in California that has a drought problem and needs to conserve and recycle water in the first place, um, but now also to protect marine life and public health from the impacts of microfibers that may be avoided. So I think, um, and, and obviously with the clothing, the source, uh, make informed decisions about the clothing that you use. I think about my closet, um, it's probably, I mean, maybe half the things have polyester in them. Um, I, I, I haven't really looked. I probably will tonight. <laughs> um, but, but you know, going forward, uh, making those purchases uh, with a mind towards this and looking for durability um, and benign sources of fabric uh, is something that consumers can, can do when making that choice. So these are all things um, that uh, environmental groups uh, will be looking at and advocating for in the future. And again, a huge uh, thank you uh, to uh, Bess and Alyssa and, and what their uh, university and uh, company are doing um, on, on this behalf. And then I do want to open it up to, to questions in our last few minutes. Yes, so we have a few minutes left here for questions. Uh, so real quick, if you have any questions that you'd still like to send in, uh, go ahead and use the question control panel there and send them in. Um, so, uh, there were a bunch of questions here on uh, impacts to freshwater. Was that anything that you guys looked at in terms of freshwater uh, life? Um, yes, yeah, so there have been some studies uh, in the Great Lakes um, looking at fish, uh, impacts on fish. Um, I'm blanking on the study right now, but it did find that there were negative impacts to the function of um, the fish's livers uh, from the compounds that were found on these microfibers. So it is also impacting um, freshwater ecosystems in a, in a similar way as marine. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and Bess, sure. another question for you. So this is all part of your uh, a master's project at the Bren School, correct? Right. So will you guys have like a full like work cited list for all of this research you've done available soon? Yes, so we do on our website, um, which uh, it's brinmicroplastics.weebly.com and it has all of our project findings on there, um, which includes uh, our publication, um, our full report, which includes um, an annotated bibliography at the back of it that has all of um, the papers that we've cited and a brief synopsis of all of those um, in the back. So yes, we have everything available on our website in our final report. Awesome, thank you. And um, Alyssa, we had a question for you wondering if uh, Patagonia is working with other clothing manufacturers to look at the issue of microfibers. Um. We are, yeah. There are several um, folks in the outdoor industry that are engaged and have been sort of since we started this project with the brand school. Um, and so, um, yes, there are other brands that are really um, interested in finding ways to engage and, and working towards a solution. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And then um, there is just one other question here that I wanted to get to real quick before we wrap up. Um, and that question was on uh, the kind of like the branding of the microplastic issue and the terminology that we use. Uh, so as I'm sure all of you know, scientists, we love to make up words, big words for things like this. Um, so have you all found in when you know, you're doing webinars like this and you're presenting, uh, does calling these things like microplastics and marine debris uh, pose a problem? Is there like a better term that you found resonates better with people? 
Um, I started referring to it as microfibers just because it's like a, you know, it's a specific category of marine debris and it, it gets a little bit more um, specific so that people know what you're talking about. But I, it can also be confusing, I think, especially in the textile industry because there's a whole other use of the term microfibers in terms of clothing and fibers. And so, um, but I've, I've been using microfibers. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, being more specific is helpful, especially because you have the microbeads, which are also microplastics that have we have hopefully found a solution to. And so it's it's nice to be able to separate um, the two. One that is just becoming a larger problem the more we look into it, versus one that we hopefully have found a solution to. Awesome. Yeah, I think um, you know having the appropriate names for the appropriate issues is really important and, and we are trying to kind of explain it a little bit more um, at least to Surfrider Foundation um, activists and followers. Um, one thing with marine debris, I know there's been a lot of backlash against that name because it kind of masks the problem and a lot of people just want to talk about marine plastic pollution because that's the most um, prevalent source of marine debris, 60 to 80 percent of all trash in the ocean is plastic and it's it's the thing that um, like we said in the presentation is very caustic to marine life doesn't break down um, has all the issues associated with it so we do try to say marine plastic pollution and then microplastics is a category under that and microbeads and microfibers are categories under microplastics so it does get a little bit in the weeds but um, it is important to understand all those terms yeah, we just had a comment uh, that NOAA and the National Park Service are now using the term microparticles to refer to this, uh, which is good to know. Let's add another one to the list. <laughs> um, we're really good at that. We're really good at that. Uh, so with that, it is 11.02, and I do want to keep you guys on for another hour. I know you all have stuff to do. So thank you all so much for presenting today. Uh, this is being recorded. We'll have it online in about an hour. And uh, definitely subscribe to the marinedebris.info listserv for more announcements of webinars like this and other things. Uh, thank you guys all so much, and have a great day. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.